Okay, as much as we all want to listen to the song. We're all jamming after after lunch. My name is Beverly and I'm the timekeeper and the dancer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in for a, a great afternoon um, and, and talk of, with our neighbors to the north in Canada. And Randy is going to take us on a little bit of a journey of what's going on up there. And Randy, when you are ready. Oh, he's ready. All right. Yeah, I was born ready. <laughs> actually, we had some panelists. Up here. Actually, to, to be honest and fair, um, I was a 15 year old that was a traveling to Europe and landed in London and managed to walk into a bar. And when the folks that were there asked, Well, what's your name? I said, Randy. They started snickering. I don't know what the heck was going on. <laughs> I said, Well, then they asked more questions. Well, were you born, Randy? Well, I was named after I was born, Randy, yes. And said, how long have you been Randy? My whole life. And they were just on the floor. <laughs> Absolutely. I then realized that my parents called me Randall for a reason. I didn't like it. it sounded too formal. Anyway, so uh, welcome to the Canadian Yelani Roundup. Uh, I want to do some quick introductions. We do kind of have a bit of a loose panel, so to speak, um, with folks. And oh, hang on, I'm gonna get out of this and go back to Zoom. So uh, online, let me do the gallery view. Oh, Move around on me. Let's hang on. We're gonna let those figure out. Okay, gallery view. So uh, we can do a quick sound test as well. But let's first go in the room uh, and say that we've got myself as the e-learning uh, can e learn as well, and then over on the side. Okay, do you want to say hello? Hello, get under here. Uh, say something about myself. Yeah, I'm a principal of an online school in British Columbia, and I'm on uh, the board of a, a group called the Federation of Independent School Association in British Columbia that represents the middle schools. And, uh, so we're going to have an online school voice in association. My name's Richard. I'm a, a director of curriculum at an online school and also the director of Sunny Fortress is a curriculum company which serves schools across Canada and the US. Terrific, thank you. So um, online, why don't we go start with uh, Frank, who is the chair of the Candy Learn Board, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, my name is Frank McCallum. I'm the associate principal of a school called Vista Virtual School. We're an online school delivering asynchronously uh, in the province of Alberta. Uh, we have campuses in the two main cities of Edmonton and Calgary. I'm based in Calgary. So, so what's that picture behind you, Frank? It's Captain Canuck. <laughs> That's correct. I use this to establish that I'm actually in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we, we, we brought Canada here. We've got little uh, drink flags, a Canadian flag, <laughs> and then courtesy of the airport in uh, Toronto. Um, okay, so, Michael, uh, let's, can you all know what we're doing, Mr. Barber? How's that? We got two Michaels on the Michael Canyon, my turn? Yeah, go. Et bonjour les amis, j'arrive de, de la belle province du Québec. Ça me fait grand plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Now that I got you all nervous, uh, uh, my name is Michael Canyon. I'm the CEO of LEARN. I'm situated here in Montreal, in the beautiful province of uh, Quebec. We're the outlier province. Um, LEARN, the organization that I run, offers uh, services to the linguistic minority across the province. We offer online classes, virtual tutorials. We work with uh, primarily with the youth, although we have adult ed uh, online programs going as well. I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, the Canadian e-learning network and the uh, former chair, and I'm very happy to have passed it on to Frank. And I'm glad to be among you today. 
this afternoon. Uh, Michael, what's that white stuff in the background there? We don't understand it. Um, c'est de la mange la mer. <laughs> <laughs> it's snow. <laughs> that, I just translated that from English, from French to English. For those of you who understand a little French, you understand that I had something else to say about it. Actually, we've had wonderful weather. It's been great here. I can't complain. Well, we, we don't complain here in Austin where it was, uh, well, Canadian temperature was, I think it was 18, 19 degrees today. Very nice, lovely, et cetera. So, uh, and then uh, Mr. Barber, who is our honorary life member and founding director of Candy Learn as well. Hi there, Michael Barber. I'm a associate professor of instructional design at Toro University in Vallejo, California. Uh, although I'm originally from Newfoundland and Labrador, and it is 85 degrees here today, and it was 84 degrees here yesterday. <laughs> you win. You win. So, um, thanks. Now, in the room, tell us a little bit about yourself, why you came here, what we can do. We've got until, I think, 2 or 3 o'clock, just around 3 or 6 or something. Yeah. We have a session following that uh, we're also going to have Michigan virtual and uh, uh, folks come in to talk a little bit about mandatory e-learning, so we'll get into that because it's an issue that's just flared up, obviously, in Ontario. Um, but uh, we want to give you a little bit of background about the rest of what's going on in Canada as a question. But let's go around the room, introduce yourself, why you're interested, why you're in this session. If you don't mind, Beverly, you can let people know. I am... Um I'm here because I'm interested in what's going on in Canada. I'm the moderator, but uh, I chose this uh, session to moderate because um, I actually have done a lot, and I saw that um, Michigan Virtual is here, and um, I was one of the pioneers with online learning in, in Michigan many years ago. We started, I ran the online portal for the state of Michigan and the seat time waiver. So I'm very vested in this, and it's always fun to find out. And I just visited Toronto in December and had heard, you know, the teachers were on strike because of this um, issue with e learning and, and uh, requirements. So um, I'm here to to find out and connect the dots and offer anything that uh, you know might be um, helpful. So Thanks. it's fun. Welcome. And multiple perspectives are always very useful when we find similarities, but more importantly, the differences. It helps us inform. Bonjour. I'm Canadian as well. <laughs> I'm from North Vancouver, uh, which is very close to uh, Randy. I am, uh, I'm here, I had to come all the way to Texas to learn about the Canadian online <laughs> system. I am, um, I'm new to online K-12 as, as of January in North Vancouver, which is uh, in British Columbia. And I'm also um, an assistant uh, professor with the New York Institute of Technology in the Vancouver campus. So the New York Institute of Technology offers master's programs in uh, science of uh, instructional technology. So I've actually been emailing with Randy for the last <laughs> couple of weeks. This is our first face-to-face -face encounter in Austin. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. So, so, so Dran, just so your background you knows, this is how we formed the national nonprofit. We came to INACL and now which the group there that was the online blended group with DLAC now, and we kept meeting at these events and we said, well, why don't we do something in Canada? Although we don't mind the locations where we get to meet. Um, so that's really essentially what we did and stitched it together and started to connect to each other's events uh, along the way. So thank you, and Christopher. Aloha, I'm from uh, Hawaii and uh, have a school that's based in Oregon, a uh, private K-12 online school that serves students worldwide. And, uh, we don't have a whole lot of students in Canada, and so I thought I'd come and learn a little bit more about Canadian online learning because basically in America the media focuses on one thing. Now, did you get to any of the uh, Australian sessions as well from the group that came from uh, us? I have not. Okay, check them out. See if you can find them. Okay, because it. It, another really good background for us. My name is Jana. Uh, I am from the state of Missouri. And I am, my title is very um, not related to what my job is, but uh, in the largest public school district in the state of Missouri, we run a basically a startup for virtual learning for um, the entire state. So our state is divided into uh, 536 school 
districts. We have over half of those school districts as partner districts. Um, this all came about as a mandate from the state. So not unlike many states in the US, if there is a mandate that you offer virtual learning to any student who would like to have virtual learning. I think the difference in our state may be that it requires each school district to find a way to pay for that. And so uh, as public school districts exchanging credits and so on to keep the public dollars public, uh, we allow partner districts to enroll their own students, therefore um, they retain the, the ADA on the students. Uh, and I'm here because I want to learn more from the leadership perspective. I'm relatively new to launch is what our program is called, but I am a 25-year educator from a school district. Thanks, and that strikes me that a very similar model to what uh, Ontario eLearning Consortium is doing. So perhaps if you grab my contact, etc., I can connect you with Todd, and you might be able to share some really interesting exchanges as well. As well as the Francophone group in Ontario also has a, a large consortium. Doug. Hi, I'm Justin. I work in Michigan Virtual, a state funded nonprofit for about 20 years. Um, we do student learning, so supplemental provider K 12 online courses, mostly high school. Uh, we did about 30,000 enrollments across the state last year in student learning. We also have done a lot more professional learning in the last few years, so uh, designed in house a lot of PD courses, all hosted online. Last year we did about 70,000 enrollments there, um, and so we're constantly growing. My role is um, research and development, so research and innovation. So trying to think about like new products and services. Great, and we'll hear from him later in the group. I'm Bobby Hall. I'm actually a virtual teacher with Florida ISD, which is in the Fort Worth, Texas area. We're actually just starting our uh, virtual school this year for one of the I'm going to learn more about it. Awesome. Hey. Hi, I'm We'll give you some examples from across Canada. You're going to stick around for the mandatory e learning session after? You might be interested in it. Okay, thanks. Chelsea. Oh, hi. I'm Chelsea Lincoln. I'm the director of the grad program at the Institute of Children's Education Program. We're the largest DL school in the province. And we're also a full time So at any point in time, please uh, jump in, interrupt uh, with questions. Uh, I'm going to run through a really quick sort of background, and then what we'll do is we'll open up to our virtual and our our active contributors here. But it's open for everyone uh, around us. So we just want to share a little bit in terms of what what we've done. You can find a lot of information on both CanyLearn.net site, uh, but also uh, I mentioned about how we've come together. And we really wanted to bring an active leading voice to e-learning uh, or blended and online learning in Canada because we don't really have one and we tend to be sort of overshadowed a lot by the U.S. And we're really pleased to be active, actively involved in supporters of DLAC as a consortium, also with the research that they're doing. 
because they're speaking the same language that we are around priorities in terms of digital and online learning. So we do events and also we manage to do as much research as we possibly can. Right now, you're looking at it's only active, uh, gainfully uh, contracted person and volunteer. Everyone else are volunteers to this group. So we came together as volunteers, we stay together as volunteers in that. We're also looking to adopt a professional learning program that was developed by eCampus Ontario in, in Ontario for uh, post-secondary instructors. We're gonna modify it for K-12 uh, and graciously it's being supported by some of our partners and organizations. So that's the kind of thing that we do. Sorry, I've got that slide already. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about research. So um, Michael, why don't you jump in on this? Do you want me just to uh, manage a slide deck? Would that be easier? Sure, that'll probably be the easiest and I'll go through quickly because I know the meat of this is really the panel stuff. So fire away. Okay, um, so one of the things that for folks that aren't from Canada in the room, and I think that's about a majority of them, is unlike the US where education is controlled at the local level, in Canada it's controlled at the provincial level and the federal government has no role whatsoever in education, whereas in the U.S., as you guys are all more than familiar, um, you know, the federal government really does have an active role in a lot of what uh, happens within our education system. Um, what that means is that we don't have much in the way of federal or even regional initiatives in Canada. Literally every province is, is very much a silo unto itself and what happens in that province and the resources developed in that province and, and even the, the curriculum and the programs in that province are very specific to that province. So do you flip to the next slide there, Randy? Oh, sorry, hang on. So my um, so if you have, haven't been a part of this before, one of the things that we've been doing for a while now, I think this year is the 13th year, it might be the 12th year, I can't remember, but uh, if you're familiar with the Keeping Pace with K-12 Online Learning uh, reports that used to be published in the U.S. and now they've got the snapshot, uh, I guess last year was Snapshot 2019, this year Snapshot 2020, but the ones at the Digital Learning Collaborative have been doing that give an overview of what's happening with digital learning in the US. The Canadian version of those is the state of the nation. Uh, so you can see the URL at the bottom and um, if you are interested in that, Randy actually has a poster this afternoon um, at I think it's five o'clock today, 4.30? 4.30 today. 4.30 today, so make sure you pop down and with a glass of wine and chat with him about that. And I, I've got the e-learning contract poster as well, so it's double whammy, come and see me. I'll have free tickets. There you go. <laughs> so come for the wine, if nothing else. Uh, flick to the next one there, Randy. So one of the things that we do have because of this siloed nature is that depending upon what province you're in, the nature of online learning could look very differently. So as you can see here, for the most part in Eastern Canada, as well as in the North where they have their own programs, they for the most part have these single province wide programs and that's the only game in town. Whereas you can see throughout Central Canada and Western Canada, they have um, depending on if it's blue or purple, they're either primarily district-based or board-based programs, or they've got a combination of a province-wide program as well as district-based programs. Um, in the case of the purple ones, typically what happens is there has been or was a provincial-wide program that was in place prior to um, the advent of online learning and that as online learning has happened you've seen a lot of the districts that have developed their own programs as a response to that or in the case of like Michael's program they're partnering with individual school boards throughout the province to uh, for them to run their programs. Flick to the next one there. Um, in terms of how things are regulated typically speaking um, you'd be amazed at how many places actually have no regulation what, whatsoever when it comes to online learning. And it's interesting because the first online schools in the U.S. appeared, well, the first one appeared in 91. Uh, for the most part, there was a lull until about 95, 96 when you saw a series of online programs that were uh, developed around that time. Uh, in Canada, it was between 93 and 95, so I always like to say we got there first. 
um, just being a, a Canadian wanting to brag about that. Um, but it, you're looking at roughly the same timeline. So both countries have been at this now for about 25 years. And if you think about your own jurisdictions in terms of the nature of regulation that governs the type of program that you're involved in, um, you know, if you're with the cyber charter school, as an example, there's probably a full section of, of the Schools Act or the Education Act that talks about it. Uh, if you're in a supplemental program, there may be legislation, although in most cases it's just DOE regulation that's been piled upon you. Um, and interestingly, in Canada, the vast majority of provinces have little to no regulation whatsoever. In fact, the only mention of distance education in any of the, the Schools Act, for the most part, is just a reference to say that the minister shall regulate distance education programs, and that, that's it. There's nothing else there. Um, the two big exceptions to this are British Columbia and Nova Scotia. In the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually the collective agreement that the Nova Scotia Teachers Union has with the government, which is a piece of legislation that obviously the legislature has to pass. In the case of BC, there's a, a distributed learning section of the, Ed, or the Schools Act, as well as a distributed learning section of the Independent Schools Act that govern uh, their policy. And some of the provinces do have I won't necessarily call it regulation. They have these policy handbooks that you're supposed to follow, but because there's no enforcement of that, or for that matter, no oversight of that, um, the level of following of that handbook can vary significantly. Next slide. A couple of trends that we see across the country. Um, one of the ones that is a relatively recent one is this idea of, uh, um, you're seeing more provinces not necessarily centralizing the programs, but considering centralizing them. So if you look at Ontario as an example, um, one of the three main things in their announcement was this idea of centralizing uh, the education system um, or centralizing the distance learning system that they've got through the online system. Uh, Alberta went through a review of uh, distributed learning about four or five years ago now. And one of the ideas there was whether or not the provincial provider should be used as a way to centralize the system. Um, like many of the reviews Alberta's had over the past decade and a half, it was done and then nothing happened. Um, even British Columbia is starting to move back to a model where they're considering a greater level of centralization in how they're doing things specifically around the funding aspect. Um, that is sort of coupled with this idea of, of trying to shift away from competing schools. One of the things that we've seen, particularly in those provinces where the, they either have a predominantly primary board-based system or they've got a combination of a provincial and district-based system, you see a lot of competitions among programs in much the same way that we do in the cyber charter industry here in the US where you have different boards that are essentially competing for the students and the enrollment that the students have. Um, let me see. The other trend that we're starting to see, um, I guess a main one, and I won't go through all these, but the bottom one there at that, in much like the supplemental programs that we saw in the US initially, where oftentimes teachers were contracted above their regular load. Um, they were doing this on the side or at night or what have you. Um, and over time, it's become part of their regular teaching responsibilities. We're starting to see that trend happening more and more in Canada now, um, to the point where it's actually the norm these days, as opposed to the exception, um, which is something that has really evolved over the last eight years or so. Uh, you're next, Randy. I think this is your slide, actually. I can do it, but. Sure, carry on. You got a prettier voice. I don't know about that, but uh, so uh, a couple of things that we've, uh, and this gets into some of the issues that have been brought up in the past year, specifically around the Ontario conversation. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not we should have centralized or decentralized systems. And for the most part, what we've seen in Canada is that the smaller provinces or territories, and by small, I generally mean population-wise, although all of the Atlantic provinces are also small geographic wise as well. 
Um, they tend to have more centralized systems, whereas the larger provinces from a population standpoint tend to have more decentralized systems. Uh, one of the interesting things is there's actually little to no difference in terms of the success rate in students in these two types of environments. In fact, in many cases, what we find is that the online programs tend to do a little bit better than the face-to-face -face programs. Now, in some cases, that's gatekeeping at the local level, as you might expect. Um, in some cases, it's the nature of curriculum that the online programs tend to offer. Uh, but a lot of it, I think, is speaking to the way in which e-learning has become established throughout many of these provinces. Um, you know, and, and the idea that in most jurisdictions, Ontario being the exception here because of a lot of the rhetoric that's been happening in the past year, um, most of the folks that are involved in this approach it from the perspective of, you know, e-learning is just another medium that instruction is delivered and we need to figure out how we can design, deliver and support it so that students can be successful as opposed to asking the question, can students have success or can this group of students or this population of students have success in this particular environment? Next slide. Sorry, I don't have highlights. There you go, so now it's your turn. So the nature of the activity, so, so Michael will give um, a bit of a background to it. So I don't, BC and Alberta, so uh, who wants to chime in? One of our two BC reps are guinea pigs, or are you, Frank? I'm good either way. Well, you got the mic. Go ahead. Sure. So, I mean, in Alberta, you get an interesting mix, as Michael mentioned. There is a centralized provider, um, the Alberta Distance Learning Center, but many boards have established or developed their own online or distance programs. Um, these tend to be the larger boards that can build that capacity, whereas the uh, Alberta Distance Learning Center or ADLC uh, tends to uh, support those smaller, much more rural boards that are never going to have the capacity to house their own Moodle server, to house their own instructional design teams, and so on. Um, the delivery is, well, well, basically it falls under two categories. It's either synchronous, they have actual traditional scheduled online classes, or as we deliver asynchronous, here's the content. You're working through it at your own pace and contacting us when you need help. Regardless of the, um, uh, the mode of delivery, the big thing is around student-teacher connection. That's been a, a big push in conversation at our uh, education department. It's been a conversation whenever we've met with our education managers within Alberta Education is around how are you making these connections because social constructivism is still the basis of, of learning. And so how are you making those connections? Um, I've just got a few things that I've noted down here while people were mentioning what they were after. Um, so the technologies that we use are you know, largely around connection. Um, but the, the hazard that we have to uh, walk here is, at least for us, is around uh, the privacy issues. So every province has its own set of privacy laws. And so we have to be able to, we're not lawyers, but we have to be able to navigate what those privacy laws are in relation to the online tools that we're using. And so an online tool may be very helpful or useful, but if its information is being stored in a jurisdiction that maybe doesn't have the same level of uh, privacy protection, we are limited in how much we can access that online tool. Um, the other thing I'll mention, because I don't want to take up too much time, is around instructional design, building courses. One of the biggest uh, benefits we've found around uh, the asynchronous approach is the ability to iterate or constantly upgrade or change or edit our content based on the analytics of what the current students are doing. And you think about this in a traditional setting, you always had that situation where you gave a lesson, maybe it didn't go as well as you were hoping for. Basically, unless you're offering that course next semester, or if you have to, you did so bad, you have to reteach it tomorrow, the, the improvements that you're gonna make are not gonna take place until next school year. In this uh, setting with the iterative approach to instructional design, you can take these analytics and you can constantly upgrade or improve the course as students are moving through it. So the first student in the, going through the course might not see exactly the same sort of content or assessments that the last person might. So I, I think that kind of gives me a, a quick little spotlight here. I don't want to take up, as I said, too much time, especially since we have some people there directly from BC. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Well, in BC, it's, it's quite interesting, as Randy noted, we are 
quite highly regulated in terms of we had a special uh, EL distributed learning agreement. British Columbia started out as distance learning, now it's called distributed learning, and it appears soon to be uh, government granted as online learning. Um, there are, there's an independent system, which is similar to the private system in the States, and then there's a public system. And the independent system, which is where I have done work, there are about 14 distributed learning schools, and the government had put a cap on that several years ago with a moratorium on new uh, distributed learning schools on the independent side, just so they could regulate and monitor effectively. It was a feeling. We're in, fully inspected by governments every year, where uh, the public side is much different. Um, most of the districts, of the 73 districts, uh, well, I should say, I don't know how many you might know, many of the districts have their own DL programs, but only a handful are so big that they're serving students outside of their district and all around the province. Um, interestingly, I would say it's about an even number of students serve in the independent and public systems in British Columbia. The independent system is quite large and strong. Uh, the public side is quite pretty strong as well. In general, British Columbia has uh, do you have a number? Thirty thousand learners. Um, uh, Michael, Michael. So Michael, do you have that number? A lot of, a lot of, a lot of students in BC. Um, let's see. What do you have, Richard? Not so much what we see anymore. I'm curious. Uh, I mean, I, I want to ask Michael questions because he's the researcher and knows a lot. So, um, so in starting, I, I get to meet with schools all across Canada. Um, and I do find that each province has a very different flavor, and I think the different flavors of how online learning looks in those different provinces has a lot to do with the policies of each province. Um, and so, Michael, I'm not sure uh, if I have this data correctly, but both Ontario and BC have high completion rates, but uh, if you look at the differences in terms of penetration of number of students who end up doing online, much higher per capita in British Columbia as it is in Ontario by like a massive margin. Am I, am I correct on that, Michael? Yeah. 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 So, it's 65,000 was the number of students in BC. Right. Yeah. And so I think the numbers are actually similar between BC and Ontario, but there's 10 times more people in Ontario. Yeah. It's about a 20% penetration rate, Michael. I think that we've got for the number of students that are taking one or more online courses in BC. And uh, Ontario, I think, is around 10% at best. Yeah. Something else I want to point out is that a lot of the conversation around online and e-learning seems to always revolve around high school. And we've been going through a big uh, government process or a funding review of how the government funds all education in British Columbia. But we're finding that the focus of government has really been on the online grade 10 through 12 upper high school sector. So these are online courses, online e-learning. But uh, the huge sector that we're serving is actually the K through nine is elementary school. It doesn't really look like online courses and traditional what we're calling online learning and courses. That's like it's a lot of personalized connection. But most of us independent DLs and many most of the public DLs are, or, you know, online schools are actually working with individual students and families. Personalized learning, using resources that they want to use. You're kind of setting up, reaching out one to one, teacher to family, teacher to student, and setting up personalized programs in K through nine. And then we find in the high school, 10 through 12 level, both schools are moving to more of the course delivery model, and it's much more formalized and curriculum. Okay, thanks. In the interest of time, Michael uh, Canuel, we want to hear from certainly Quebec, but uh, it, as always, I exaggerated. So, yeah, in BC, it's around 10% penetration. 5% on Quebec, Ontario, uh, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, and the others are below 5% in terms of the number of students taking one or more online courses. Uh, Mr. Canuel. Dr. Canuel. Doctor, uh, okay. <laughs> just kidding. Man. Uh, first of all, in, in Quebec, we don't have oh. much the way of regulation at all. Uh, I think uh, the upside to that, of course, is that... Uh, you, you, have to, you have to introduce Derek now. Come on. Oh. This is Derek, uh, 163 pounds of Black Russian Terrier. He comes to the office every day. He runs the uh, the shop here, and uh, I, I have to follow his orders. He's telling me it's cookie time, so uh, I guess I'm, you'll have to wait, though. 
Yeah, uh, part of the situation for us right now in Quebec is that uh, we're doing a lot of very interesting things uh, in terms of uh, online uh, um, uh, schooling uh, in, in pockets. The provincial government still hasn't gotten around to uh, uh, providing any legislation, and it's not likely to happen anytime soon because it requires significant changes to our uh, Education Act. So the, the upside is that it gives us an opportunity, uh, organizations like LEARN, to really innovate, to move forward, to constantly adjust and adapt without having to conform to a lot of um, um, regulations and, uh, and policies coming out of a ministry that typically works at the uh, glacial uh, pace and I think that's typical of both bureaucracies. So as I said, we've been able to across the province do a lot of different things. We have organizations out in Eastern Quebec like FADIO that came together to meet the needs of a, a very regional area. So uh, Michael Barr was 100% right. It's a, it's a question of, um, uh, the districts and regions responding to uh, uh, to the, the various needs. We've been doing this since 1999, and we've constantly been, uh, been adapting our uh, our whole approach. Uh, of late, we've moved towards and, and kind of like redefined some things. Like when we refer to blended learning now, it, it really refers to just using uh, a whole variety of tools and, and in, the, in the delivery method that we ought to use. So uh, we'll have synchronous and asynchronous uh, classes running at, uh, well, a, a synchronous class will include asynchronous resources. We'll use uh, voice threads. We use all kinds of different things. The idea is really to, uh, and Frank pointed this out before, we're socially constructivist and uh, inspired. That's our curriculum. Uh, we're, we're moving uh, always more and more towards competencies. So as a result, uh, we have to adapt uh, what we do online in, uh, to, to reflect that. So we've done a lot of interesting things in that particular area. We're very excited about it. Um, one of the things that we've noticed over the years is that people generally overestimate the metacognitive skills and the self-regulatory skills of uh, online students, especially at the high school level. And so um, what we realized and, and what we've adapted is uh, a lot more hand-holding for our students uh, um, and a lot more social interaction. So uh, our, our synchronous classes really offer a lot of opportunities for group work, um, a lot of exchange between the students, among the students, um, and with the teacher. Uh, uh, and as I said, more often than not, uh, courses that are completely asynchronous, that are the, the kind that uh, our Ministry of Education is trying to work on right now, they are um, basically a, a course in a box. And uh, uh, they just try to fill the need of as many students as possible, but don't do, and again, I'm referring to Frank, they don't re uh, respond and, and take into consideration uh, the different uh, learner profiles that are out there. Uh, we have some students who do need a lot of hand-holding, some who are very uh, autonomous learners. But uh, So what's happened is that we, when we work in an unregulated environment, uh, uh, we've been able to work a lot on adapting and adjusting to uh, those particular learner profiles and, and, and personalizing it on an ongoing basis, constantly adjusting and adapting. So we do use our analytics the same way. We uh, And we also really get right down and dirty with our, our students and, and we're, we're constantly polling them and, and, and trying to get, get feedback from them. The student voice online is just as important to, uh, as it is in, in a regular classroom. So um, we have lots of opportunities. Obviously, when you're not regulated, that you don't quite get the support that you would like to get from your provincial government. So it's, it's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, for the time being, we're happy with the way things are, but I wouldn't mind a little bit of support in places from our, our provincial government. So it's a, it's a little bit of a toss-up in, in that way. Thank you, Michael. So in the interest of time, we got about three minutes or so before we switch into the next session. Uh, questions of the panel of what you've seen here. Insights. What are you walking away with? More questions? I think the interesting thing about Canada <clears throat> is that um, you each one of your provinces is doing something a little bit different and by virtue of the way that you're governed um, I think primarily is probably a driving a, a driving force um, but I, I there's a lot of similarities of what you know the kinds of issues that you're dealing with that I think we find in the schools and in the programs the virtual programs here in the United States so the growth has been kind of parallel you know, along the way, you know, trip over a lot of the different things um, that, you know, we've done 
over time uh, that you you've tackled. So. Yeah, I, I, my client, Barbara, I'm going to give you the last word, but I'm going to echo what John uh, Watson here opened with, is that the future is now, it's just not evenly, are widely distributed. So there are pockets of innovation and there are, are situations which there is strong use of digital technologies, immersive uh, in a virtual environment, online at a distance, there's very successful programs, some of them are represented here, good completion rates, et cetera, et cetera, is it across the board? No. Um, which province would you say has it most likely uh, widely distributed uh, in Canada? Widely distributed how? In that there is more in, uh, schools and boards immersed in using digital learning uh, environments in as part of their programs. I would say Ontario, and that's a large part of, because they have a province-wide LMS they have 120 courses that they've made available to any board in the throughout the province and they've got about a third of their students that have active enrollments in the LMS even if they aren't taking a distance course. Okay so it is in that licensing and making it available to teachers as a resource which is where the, the differences are and I would add BC as an afterthought to that in that the policy and the funding was supportive for the distributed learning schools. And if they offered the services to the student, they could claim the money for, for, for the, that particular course for the student. So that caused a lot more growth. Uh, so the policies and the funding uh, are the two key driving factors. And I'll go back to be, uh, Alberta. During the distance ed review in Alberta, uh, Alberta education changed their funding model and it changed essentially what we were reporting on, change the circumstances like that. BC is sitting here waiting for that change to happen in from its ministry. So central governments do have a significant impact, and that's what the concern is. Uh, and we'll talk more about that with Ontario. Um, I want to thank uh, the folks online. Uh, any final comments or words? Actually, I have one final thought. Someone was mentioning there about the essentially the similarities and differences. If you've never seen it before, they actually have two editions of this now. It's a free online book that Catherine Kennedy and Rick Ferdig authored called The Handbook of Research on K-12 Online and Blended Learning. Um, the reason I thought of it was because of the person in the room that mentioned the differences and similarities between Canada and the U.S. And that was actually the focus of one of the chapters that I authored in there. Um, in the second edition, Randy is the lead author on a chapter that looks at essentially what online, what's happening in e-learning in Canada. Plus, this is a great resource and you can download the entire PDF for free. Um, or if you want a paper copy, you can buy it as well. I think it's about 40 bucks or something. But you can download the entire PDF, um, all 40 odd chapters for free. And the first edition is there as well. So I'll just put in a plug for that since someone mentioned it. Thank you. I'd like to, one final thing. I'd like to put in a plug for Michael Barber. If you're not familiar with his research, I mean, he's phenomenal, and it, he's probably the most current um, in in this. I mean, you can always find his research. So thank you, Michael, for the work that you have done and continue to do. Yep, and we thank him that he's part of Canadian Learning Network and a, a advocate, supporter, and volunteer uh, for us. So thanks.